got into, seemed to be your responsibility. When we got into office, it was over 40 percent. Six, seven years before, it was over 40 percent. Yeah, but the current government's halved it again. The current government has halved it again because it had the foundation on which we built. It was 42 percent when we came into office in the year 2001. We run away inflation, a depreciation currency. All of those substantial efforts had been made to correct those before we left. But I, that is not to say that the work was a finished product. It was a work in progress, that it continues to be a work in progress. It's, it seems to me that, that, that what's important about the last few years in Ghana is that the international community, thinking about World Bank, IMF, and indeed the Chinese government as, of, as well, they've all looked at what's happening in Accra and they've given it a stamp of approval by lending uh, and investing in a massive way inside your country. seems to me whatever you say about the current Mills administration, the international view is that his economic management is worth investing in. We have oil. We've never had oil before. We now have oil in commercial quantities and uh, it's being developed by companies that know what they're doing. And the first oil is really the biggest responsibility for this dramatic expansion of our national accounts and receipts. Well, are you sure? Because uh, look, look, look at positive. the reality. I mean, it's going to be huge because you've got but up to 700 million barrels worth in the sea just off your shores. But, but that's exactly what it is. No, but, but exactly hang on a minute. The, the reality is, if we're talking about deficits, we're talking about economic management, right now you're only pumping about 70,000 barrels a day. So you can't say that everything that's but been achieved in the last four the, years the is the all figures, about oil revenue. The figures that the president himself gave in the State of Nation of Words was that oil revenue last year were over four hundred million dollars. There's a huge... But there's gold, there's cocoa, there's a whole heap of other things. All, a... all I'm saying to you is if you look at China for example, three billion dollars in, in grants and, and credit lines plus another very 13, welcome. 13, very welcome. Yeah, 13 all of the, billion dollars worth of those, infrastructure all investment. All those are very, very welcome. So you have but no if, problem with that? I don't have any problem with it. I think the Chinese involvement interest in our country is a very healthy one. It's one that all of us are very, are very comfortable with in Ghana. What we have to be satisfied is that we get value for money in terms of these investments. That is what the debate has do? been. Um, there are serious questions about it, the way that the loans were structured. Our, uh, in Parliament, we spoke about it in very clear terms. We have continued to insist that much better negotiations could have taken place over the, the money and how it was to be spent. And what about, the, what about the quality of the infrastructure work the Chinese offer? In Angola, there are many people who are now talking about roads being washed away, hospitals subsiding because they were poorly and built. The, and these are all part of the argument as to making sure that we get true value for money. And that is why there's been a hesitation on our part in endorsing this um, opening. What it is, and I think that that is something that we should make very clear, is that we welcome the interest of everybody in the development of the Ghanaian economy how we handle that interest and how it plays in favor of the majority of our people, the masses of our people, that's our concern. And to be clear about it, and I am interested in the way you've hedged some of your approval for what the Chinese are doing in your country, to be clear about it, if you are Ghana's next president, will you, for example, allow them to build up a significant stake in your oil industry and in your extractive mineral industries? If, if they're going to do so in terms that, are, the, 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 that appear to us normal and mutually beneficial, why not? So that's a yes? Yes, absolutely. How, what sort uh, of percentage stake could you imagine the Chinese ultimately We will owning? see. We will we'll see. We'll see how, how the history will play itself out. Because well, I mean, yeah, the, Ghanaian, not, the Ghanaian but, people have to vote for you. They want to know what your vision the is, is, is of, of the, the vision, degree to which you'll let China no, buy into your no, economy. The, what it is is that we will look on a case-by-case -case basis at everybody who's interested in coming into Could they have a country. controlling stake in, in I don't think we want anybody to have a controlling stake in our matters. We don't want to be the pawn of any power, whether it is left, right, China, Chinese, American, or anybody else. We want the controlling stake in, over in, in, Ghana, in the Ghanaian economy to be in the hands of Ghanaians. That is Do you a, think, let me ask you this final point on China. Do you look across uh, your own continent and feel that some countries are in danger of allowing China too much power and too much control in their economies. I think that what it is that what we should be all very clear about is that so long as we continue to be raw material producing countries, changing the destination of the export of those raw materials doesn't necessarily change the basic facts of life of our economies. And it is the changing of those basic facts that is the critical challenge for us. So. Seeing China becoming now 
the destination of preference for the export of African raw materials. As far as some of us are concerned, it doesn't change the facts about uh, the African economy. It is the fundamental nature of the African economy that we require to change if indeed we're going to bring prosperity to the mass of our people. And that is to move away from raw material producing economies to industrializing value added economies. That's the challenge for and us. And to the extent the Chinese investment, American investment, French investment, Japanese investment, come where it is, British investment, plays into that fundamental objective. I welcome it. To the extent that it attempts to dilute or divorce itself or veer away from that, I would be critical of it. Right. Our fundamental objective uh, is what we need to see established in our relations with whoever. Yeah, all right. Well, I've got that point. But uh, I've been reading some of your campaign speeches over the last few weeks and months. You consistently accuse the Mills administration of overseeing rampant corruption. I think it's fair to say, looking back through Transparency International reports and many others, that corruption has been a problem in your country for a long time. Yeah. certainly goes back beyond the Mills administration into your administration and beyond that too. But I just look at what the current government has done, for example, signing up to the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, which the Angolans, for example, refused to do, uh, uh, introducing uh, proposals for transparency in the auditing of contracts and other things in the oil business, seems to me they're making a real effort to do the, things differently in Africa. But the, 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 at the end of the day, what are we, we left with? For instance, in the management of our petroleum revenues, our original position was that we should create a special petroleum account outside the consolidated fund so that we can look and track these revenues in an open and transparent manner. Because if you put mm. the monies directly into the budget, the difficulty exists of finding out exactly how they play out. That, for instance, was a position that the government did not subscribe to, that we should create a special account which would enable the tracking to take place. Do you believe that as is perhaps the case in Nigeria and Angola and Equatorial Guinea, there is a real danger that this discovery of major oil off the coast of your country could become a, a curse rather than a blessing. That has to be a concern for all of us Ghanaians. And the only way we can address it is the institutional arrangements that we make in the management of this new resource. It has to be. It has to be a constant source of anxiety and worry for each one of us that if we don't put in the proper mechanisms, the proper institutional arrangements, it could be a, it shouldn't be. It should be a source for us of additional resources that would enable us to focus on the transformation of our economy. I just That's wonder the why, I why the Ghanaian people should believe that you are any more committed to, to a transparent oil industry, and not just oil industry, but transparency generally in the, in the relationship between I mean, politics and business, than, than the current administration. First because of frankly, all, your record as a justice minister and senior minister in the previous administration doesn't suggest that your values were frankly were any different from theirs. The values are very different. Um, first of all, we're talking about people, I'm talking about us, who were at the very forefront of the struggle for democracy in Ghana. And what does that mean? That means that we want an open system of government accountable government and that has been the very strongest f driving force behind the political careers of many of us who are now today in the opposition making sure that our country didn't become like so it had become in, in Africa one party government authoritarian government that would be open democratic government so that's the first the second is the record in, 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 in government. And many of the measures that were put in place to ensure transparency, the Whistleblowers Act, the procurement law, all of these were legislation that were began by me when I was Attorney General in order to create the framework that would enable people to go. I mean, for instance, the Whistleblowers Act, what we're saying, the first time it was tested in Ghana, 
the whistleblowers under President Lewis. No, sure, Lewis, I understand what you're saying, but, but I, I, ended up in jail. They didn't. Uh, but but <laughs> the, the greatest indictment, frankly, of, of your government is the way in which you squandered money and left this huge hole in the, in the I budget I, I, deficit. I, I, I and believe. I think you I think would that, now acknowledge that that, no. that was a profound problem with no, the last time your I, party was I, in power. I, I, I don't accept that. I don't accept that proposition at all. Well, I'll tell, I think what, what, I'll tell you what the Ghanaian people, it seems to me, from reading a lot of stuff in the in the Ghanaian press, want to know is where exactly is the money going to come from? next time around if you're in power for some of the very extravagant promises you've made you for example have offered free secondary schooling for all Ghanaians a promise you say you absolutely will absolutely. deliver in four years uh, in absolutely, power. So absolutely have you costed it how much will it cost the costing the costing is, is being done I mean very very soon we will well, be in a position you can't make a promise like no, that no 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 costing. very soon we're, going to, we're very soon we're going to be putting it out prefer you don't know how much I do know I have well, but I prefer tell to tell the Ghanaian people directly well, before you, I tell you many of them I prefer, can't talk you can no, tell me and doesn't matter I would prefer to make that statement to the people of Ghana directly first as, as to the cost and any so time. you do know the cost oh we do and we have a very good idea how and how and also what? we're going to finance it well we you don't believe, have to give, you're obviously not going to give me the figures but just but tell me how you're going we're to pay going for to it because it's clearly going to be a very great cost you've got to train the teachers you've got to build new schools all of that is all of that is, has been adequately costed and we believe that first of all the new revenues will help more efficient management of what we have now growth in the Ghanaian economy these are the three sources which are going to enable us to fulfill that promise. And it's a promise that has been solemnly made to the Ghanaian people and is going to be solemnly kept. Not because it's a campaign promise, but because it is a necessity for the future of our country to educate all our young people okay. and not to acquiesce in a, rela in a situation whereby only segments of the community that have some money are able to educate it's their a, children. It's an interesting it's point. It's a major make. issue well, then, of human capital development. Indeed. And if we do not make the effort to, 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 to achieve that, the development paradigm that we want to achieve is going to be very difficult for us to do Let so. me quote to you the words of Patrick Kawua, a Ghanaian who used to work for Microsoft in the US. He came home, he set up a private university just outside Accra, I believe it's very successful. He says Africa's reached an inflection point. The march to democracy across the con continent is unstoppable, but he says we can bring change in one generation. The key is how we train a new generation of leaders. That, he says, will make all the difference. Sounds like you agree with that. I do. Well, in that case, here's I my last strongly. thought to you. You, um, I'll be polite about it, but you're, you're a veteran politician in Ghana. Absolutely. You, your father yes. was president. You've served uh, in two administrations from, 08, uh, from 2000 to 08. You have an elite background. You were educated in the UK. You've been around a long time. Doesn't Ghana need a new generation of the leaders Ghanaian, to fulfill this promise? The Ghanaian people will make that decision. I mean, that, 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 that's all I can say. The Ghanaian people will make that decision, whether or not a new generation of... I think that at all times what you're looking for is whether people resonate, whether people are articulating the views and aspirations of ordinary people. Do you yeah. think you can connect with Absolutely. ordinary Ghanaians, given that. everything I've just said about your background? Absolutely. And I, I think that the, the, the evidence is out there. To, the evidence is quite clear out there. If, if, if one well, it isn't yet, because you lost the last election. By, by hair's breadth. By hair's breadth. If one was so out of touch with the realities of the lives of ordinary Ghanaians, perhaps the margin would have been even more stronger. I think that we, I mean, you, you can look at the statistics <laughs> either way. But I, I, have no dif dif I have no difficulty in, in asserting that indeed one, can, we, we, one connects and will continue to connect because you're talking about the matters of concern to ordinary people their access to education, their access to jobs, how the economy is impacting on their lives, whether or not it is going to be possible for us to continue to well, operate the kind of economy that we've been operating so far. These are the critical questions. They're the questions, that will, and you will have to answer them in the election campaign. I hope absolutely. we can have you back when you are president, or indeed if you fail to you're be president. You're thanks wishing. for thank being on Hard Talk. <laughs> thank you indeed for having me. Thank you. I want to thank warmly the organizers of the Oxford Africa Conference for the opportunity to be part of this prestigious event, which is being held in this auditorium, named out of the greatest African of them all, Nelson Mandela. Since by the generosity of the Ghanaian people and with the blessing of Almighty God, I assumed the high office of President of the Republic of Ghana some 16 months ago, 
have been privileged to address audiences in the three most renowned institutions of higher learning in Britain. First, at Cambridge University in November 2017, last year. And then last month in April, at the London School of Economics. And today, the icing on the cake. <laughs> At Oxford, arguably the greatest center of learning in the world. I'm indeed honored and very pleased to be back here again. I know we complain about the rest of the world treating Africa as though it was one monolithic country instead of a continent of 54 sovereign nations. But I know that the rest of the world is well able to smell out and decide on what they see as individual successes. Let me give you an example close to home. For most of you in the audience today, it is probably before your time. But in the late 1970s and up to the mid-1980s, as a result of the discovery of considerable petroleum deposits and resources, Nigeria was booming. It was the place to be. We Ghanaians, who were going through very difficult times then, would arrive at Heathrow Airport and be herded into a cage to be subjected to the full third degree by immigration. And we would look on as our Nigerian cousins would be way through with a welcome, sir, and a welcome, madam. The newspaper headlines in this country were full of Nigerians leaving or forgetting bundles of money in taxes and telephone booths. Nigerians were the preferred tenants for those who had apartments to let. You could stop by any Thomas Cook shop on any high street in this country and buy or sell Naira, the Nigerian currency. And you could do the same in New York, and I suspect in many other Western country cities. I do not need to spell out today's reality to anyone in this audience. I cite this just to make the point that the outside world is well able to tell that there are separate sovereign nations on the African continent. But when the news is not good, then Africa is treated as one entity. The lesson must be clear to us. If there's an Ebola outbreak in three West African countries, all Africans are potential carriers. If a grenade is thrown in a market in Mombasa, a travel alert will be issued to potential travelers to all Eastern and Central African countries. During the period I referred to when Nigerians were being welcomed with open arms into this country, there was a lot of instability on the African continent. And Nigeria herself did not have a democratic government apart from a five-year interim. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to develop Africa and get known for prosperity and opportunities rather than poverty and despair. Respect will follow without our asking for it. The problem we have, and this would apply to most countries on the continent, is that we have already lost so much time that we cannot afford a slow period of growth. We have a dynamic, restless, young population who demand and deserve the best in the world. They are not in the mood to wait for the dividends from a slow progression, as the trek across the Sahara vividly illustrates. It has become obvious to us that if we continue along the same path that we have pursued since independence, we're not likely to achieve the rapid development that we need, which is the only way we can generate jobs for our young people and hope for the future. Our continent of Africa is endowed with immense natural resources. We have every mineral that mankind lusts after and which is required to run a modern economy. Our continent is in possession of 30% of the Earth's remaining mineral resources. Like many other parts of the African continent, Ghana is a country that is well endowed with many natural resources such as gold, bauxite, diamonds, oil, gas, timber, cocoa, water, fertile land, you name it, we have it. Unfortunately, if you took an honest look at the state of our nation, 
you would not know that we have these natural endowments. We look poor, we feel poor, and we have huge infrastructural deficits. The reason is not far to seek. Since independence, we've been stuck with the economic structure defined for our status as a colony. That is the production and export of raw materials, which puts us at the mercy of widely fluctuating commodity prices over which we have no control, and the import of manufactured commodities from the industries of the colonial power, which creates wealth and jobs there, but not at home. This economic structure has been exacerbated by mismanagement, corruption, and high fiscal deficits, which have become the hallmarks of our economy and which we finance through borrowing and foreign aid. The foreign aid quotient especially has been a debilitating factor in our efforts to develop our country. It saps our self-confidence and undermines the dignity and respect that will propel us to prosperity. The very sad part of the aid dependency is that it was never intended to help us develop to stand on our own. It must be clear to all of us that the economic transformation we aspire will not come through aid. Sixty years is a long time to have been trying something, and I believe it is time to accept that aid will not take us to the status of a developed nation. It is also obvious that many of those who have been giving aid no longer do so with any enthusiasm. It shows in the many ruses that have been devised to make the aid money remain in the donor nation instead of the recipient nation. It is time to relieve the aid donors of their burden. It is not a healthy setup. <laughs> it is not a healthy setup. It is bad for both the giver and the receiver. Sixty years after independence, we should embrace and move to a Ghana beyond aid, indeed an Africa beyond aid. It bears repeating that I'm not disclaiming aid, nor am I looking a gift horse in the mouth. I certainly do not want to embark on any ideological path to inflict poverty on us. I will not sing to a refrain of I am poor and proud. There's no pride or dignity in poverty. There's no dignity in having hungry children or mothers dying in childbirth and there's no dignity in drinking dirty or polluted water. I mention these in particular because they happen to be the sectors usually populated by the aid agencies and NGOs. Ladies and gentlemen, I suggest that no self-respecting nation should abdicate these sectors to aid agencies or NGOs. We should set our minds to a deliberate qualitative change in all aspects of our lives, especially in the structure of our economy, the nature of our infrastructure, the education of our young people, and acquisition of skills. It is time to abandon the economic structure that was designed to serve us when we were a colony. We must add value to the many commodities that we export. We're embarking upon an ambitious program in Ghana that we are calling the One District, One Factory Initiative, which is to serve as the basis for the rapid industrialization of our country and providing jobs for the many young unemployed. Youth unemployment poses the biggest security threat to our country. When most of these factories get going, the main activity will be value addition and food processing. The One District, One Factory Initiative goes hand in hand with our determination to add value to our natural resources. We are about to establish by Act of Parliament a Ghana Integrated Bauxite and Aluminum Development Authority, which will manage all the bauxite resources of the country and whose purpose will be to drive the establishment of the entire value chain of our bauxite resources so that the process of transformation of those resources from bauxite to alumina to aluminium will take place in Ghana and thereby lead to the creation 
of the significant numbers of derivative industries that are associated with aluminum. And aluminum, as we all know, is the metal of the future. We have the same plans for the development of our considerable iron ore and manganese deposits. The development of a steel industry is crucial for the prospects of a successful industrial economy. I would like to conclude with one important observation. People ask, Ghana and indeed Africa beyond aid is meant to be more than a slogan. It is meant to propel us into the frame of mind that will quicken our pace of development. It is meant to change our mindset from one of dependency and living on handouts to one of achieving our destiny. It is meant to put us in charge of our own affairs and make us truly independent. Above all, Ghana Beyond Aid will give us the respect and dignity we deserve. If I have touched a few hearts among you today to make you start thinking of Africa in a new light, then maybe there's some hope yet for rhetoric. I thank you all for your attention. It's to be here with you this morning. And I thank the Spanish Prime Minister, Senor Pedro Sanchez, for me inviting me to deliver this statement of this forum. It is rather sad that the pandemic has deprived me and an ardent fan of many decades of Los Blancos of the opportunity of touring the Santiago Bernabeu Stadium as part of my brief visit to Madrid. Hopefully, sooner rather than later, we'll be able to return our lives back to normal once we rid our respective nations of COVID-19. What the pandemic has taught us is that our world is truly interdependent. For a virus that originated in China has engulfed the entire globe. We need to cooperate more and we need to cooperate smartly. In the midst of all the complexities of the 21st century, our interdependence requires such cooperation. So I applaud Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez for convening Focus Africa 2023 and for the brilliance of the Plan Africa 3 initiative. Excellencies, I'm certain that all of us gathered at this event have become accustomed to news headlines such as at least 43 African migrants drown off Libya, UN agencies say. African migrants drown as boat sails to Spain. At least 140 migrants drown off Senegal coast, UN says. For those of us who come from a continent that is in possession, possession of some 30% of the Earth's remaining mineral resources and some 50% of the world's arable lands. It is disheartening to acknowledge that African youth do not see a future in their respective countries and are willing to cross the Sahara Desert on foot and drown in the Mediterranean Sea in a desperate bid to reach the mirage of a better life in Europe. It is eloquent testament to the inability of the current structures of African economies, producing and exporting raw materials, importing manufactured goods and services from Europe and elsewhere, to generate the numbers of decent, well-paying jobs that Africa's youth cre crave. But fortunately, there's now a consensus amongst the current crop of African leaders of the urgent need to remedy the situation and relate with the rest of the world on the base of trade and investment cooperation in value-added activities. As President of the Republic of Ghana, I believe the time has come for Africa, Spain, and indeed the rest of Europe to establish a sustainable strategic partnership based on trade and investment cooperation on the exchange of value-added transactions. It would obviate the resort to aid which has not achieved its purpose. Hence the mantra of Ghana beyond aid, which is the overarching goal of Ghanaian public policy. Indeed, 
a very important plank of this new strategic partnership between Africa, Spain and Europe would be the strong support for the African Continental Free Trade Area AFCFTA, which began trading on 1st January. The AFCFTA will link all the 54 markets of Africa, covering 1.3 billion by 2050. It will co cover an estimated 2.5 billion people and have over a quarter of the world's working age population. Imagine the investment and business opportunities offered by the infrastructure required to link our markets more effectively. And imagine the business opportunities that this huge market would offer for manufacturing and service firms from Spain and Europe that could establish production facilities in Africa to serve the African markets. And with the enhanced growth that will result from all of these, the market opportunities for exporters from Spain and Europe could be truly amazing. Inasmuch as the pandemic has wreaked havoc on the Ghanaian economy, we've seen a relatively favorable situation with respect to our health outlook, contrary to the fears many had about the impact of the pandemic in Africa. Our active cases in Ghana are declining, and now stand at some 2,410 cases. We've recorded some 740 deaths and have since the start of March vaccinated some 500,000 Ghanaians. The goal is to vaccinate 20 million Ghanaians by the end of the year, which would effectively mean the vaccination of the entire adult population of our country. We in Ghana are embarked on the path of accelerated economic development through improved macroeconomic management, improved domestic revenue mobilization emanating from reforms in public policy revenue and administration, creation of conducive environments for businesses to flourish, tackling corruption and curbing excessive bureaucratic procedures. We are ensuring that all our children have unfettered access to education through our free senior high school policy. We're moving towards attaining universal health coverage for all Ghanaians through the National Health Insurance Scheme. We're processing more and more of our raw materials through our One District, One Factory initiative. We become a net exporter of food under our program for planting for food and jobs. And we're determined to move Ghana to a situation beyond aid. We have set our sights high. And to our friends in Spain and Europe, I urge you to join us in building a continent of prosperity and societies of equal opportunities for all. Once again, I thank you, Mr. Prime Minister, and I look forward to welcoming you to Ghana very soon. I thank you your attention. The Russian embassy in Ghana has cautioned Ghana's government against blaming its economic woes on Russia's attack on Ukraine, which was led by Vladimir Putin. The Akufo Addo administration has repeatedly attributed the country's current economic woes to global crises like COVID-19 and the recent Russia-Ukraine conflict. Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Bawomia appeared to take the same stance in a lengthy economic lecture aimed at addressing the country's current state, implying that the recent Russia-Ukraine conflict was to blame for the country's dire economic situation. The Russian embassy in Accra, on the other hand, disagrees and has stated in a series of tweets on its official Twitter account that Ghana's economic problems began before the invasion of Ukraine. The embassy stated that it was aware of an increase in the number of news articles accusing Russia of all negative trends in agricultural markets, bleak prospects for food access, and massive farmer losses, and that the truth was different. The embassy then delved into the crisis's alleged roots and drivers, providing a comprehensive and objective analysis free of emotions and political bias. Russia's embassy to Ghana explained in the tweet that food costs began to rise in mid-2020 and peaked in February 2022, reaching an all-time high. In the post-COVID recovery era, the tweets outlined, a true market shock was produced by increased demand and rising prices on food, raw materials and transportation services, especially freight. The Russian-Ukraine war cannot be blamed, 
according to the embassy, and that the current deplorable economic position is not a result of two months of this year's invasion. To pay. The U.S., when they borrow money, they're getting it in 1.5, 1.9 interest rate. Africans, when they get the same amount of money, they're paying 9, 10%. The people who don't need a break, they get a break. The ones who need a break, they don't get a break. The sheer survival of the World Bank IMF is based on the fact that African countries and, and many other developing countries do not succeed. Their success is based on our failure. That has to change. And guess who can make that change? We, the children of Africa, we, the Africans, are the ones who have to say, we know your game now. Enough is enough. We're not playing it anymore. And this is where the diaspora come in. There are more Ghanaian doctors in New York City than in, in the entire country of Ghana. There are more doc Nigerian doctors in LA than in the entire country of Nigeria. So let's be serious here. What Africa needs is capacity, capacity, capacity. And that capacity is in the diaspora. So it behooves us to bring the diaspora together. Let them understand what is really going on in our Africa. Diaspora are not going home. Diaspora are angry about Africa because they are not understanding the root cause of why Africa is where it is today. They think getting rid of a president will take care of the problem. Far from it. That president is just going to be replaced by another one who is going to equally suffer from the same difficult environment to work in. So let's look at an Africa that must be free to take care of herself, an Africa that's free from exploitation from outsiders. The multinationals who are stealing from Africa every day in broad daylight. I use an example of the DRC. If you ever fly very low over the DRC, you'll see tarmacs in the jungle. You'll see 747s flying into DRC, picking up minerals and flying right out. The same multinationals are responsible for arming young people and giving them MK-16s. Because why? Their satellites in the skies are telling them where that village is. There's, there are lots of diamonds. So what do they do? Arm young people, drag them up, and send them to go chop off a few heads. The rest of the village runs away, so they come behind and do their illegal mining. We black people must understand what is really going on. Because what we are shown instead is, oh, look at those Africans killing each other. There are some serious games that have been played in Africa for far too long. And once we understand that, we can strategize as to how we can begin to bring the difference and bring the change that Africa needs. And that change can only come if the African diaspora are united and the Wakanda villages, as I call them. It is our organized way of saying, starting with one African diaspora center of excellence, it will be a new city, a developmental hub that we can then take from there Every sector is developed. Take healthcare. How many doctors do we need in this region to take care of this many people? We pick up education, same thing. We pick up engineering. We pick up electricity. How many megawatts of power do we have in the region? How many do we need? Be it solar, be it wind, be it hydro, be it geothermal, be it nuclear. The Russian embassy in Ghana has cautioned Ghana's government against blaming its economic woes on Russia's attack on Ukraine which was led by Vladimir Putin. The Akufo Addo administration has repeatedly attributed the country's current economic woes to global crises like COVID-19 and the recent Russia-Ukraine conflict. Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Bawomia appeared to take the same stance in a lengthy economic lecture aimed at addressing the country's current state, implying that the recent Russia-Ukraine conflict was to blame for the country's dire economic situation. The Russian embassy in Accra, on the other hand, disagrees and has stated in a series of tweets on its official Twitter account that Ghana's economic problems began before the invasion of Ukraine. The embassy stated that it was aware of an increase in the number of news articles accusing Russia of all negative trends in agricultural markets, bleak prospects for food access, and massive farmer losses, and that the truth was different. The embassy then delved into the crisis's alleged roots and drivers, providing a comprehensive and objective analysis free of emotions and political bias. Russia's embassy to Ghana explained in the tweet that food costs began to rise in mid-2020 and peaked in February 2022, reaching an all-time high. In the post-COVID recovery era, the tweets outlined, a true market shock was produced by increased demand and rising prices on food, raw materials and transportation services, especially freight. The Russian-Ukraine war cannot be blamed, according to the embassy, 
and that the current deplorable economic position is not a result of two months of this year's invasion. Hello, I'm Shia Fu, Kofi Quarantini, Nane, E Levi, E Levi, E Levi, Kasana, Yakasagana, Ubiarika, E Levi, and Ti, say, say, me, Ti, bing me, ni E Levi. Because E Levi problem, no, a e simple. Now, Ghana government is on Peso, or Tia, say, in Tine, a betrema children, no, what Tia, see ye, I was Shia Fu, twenty twenty, IMF, ma Ghana, one billion dollars billion with the b same year no world bank ma ghana 430 million dollars nina for covid in 2021 no imf for some ma ghana one billion dollars bill one billion with a b now world bank some ma ghana 130 million Dollars in 20, uh, 2021, no, so I have one billion, 130 million. Yeah, if he World Bank buy any IMF buy, no, no, we say post COVID rejuvenation program. Say what be my young economy, no, so into no, World Bank, the IMF, this is Ghana, my Ghana, Ghana government to call Bank of Ghana, Koyi 20 billion cities to say COVID in T. Nebuchadnezzar. What World Bank come on with two billion? Uh, IMF come with two billion. World Bank come on with five hundred and sixty million dollars for COVID. I know on some. Most some call Bank of Ghana could use twenty billion cedis. Say COVID in T. Say I see can we move home contain trying here? And I want to move. We move here. But be a we for Ghana. E levy tax, who call ports are e levy, who call airport, who call hotels, but what they are to be beer as or Ghana, e levy, e levy, e levy, says he can hen alpha, petrol, e levy, who call union my port, e levy, says he can hen alpha, na in tis a ne government a person or tray and say Ghana for a be a yard and a year jumentina or de sa e levy nereba, yes, you perceive a tray government to say. And you say, I do in your more year who never cosono near Jai Amano. If you say, who per se, wunya, ye levy, young, ye are responsible citizens, ye and per se, ye 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 stand by, yet dinner hockey car, ye train fire, or no, I can say, yes, ye are responsible citizens, right? Into ye are responsible citizens. Nana Tinney say, So who per se would free sika, not would ye be beer. Because young credit rating record former, and yet young Abra bought now the E-Levy barber to so. I didn't because there is over three, almost three billion Ghana cities a record to the presidency. Three billion Ghana. In it also by 75%. What also by 75%? I will say by 375 million dollars. 375 million save and not at the presidency. You don't need three billion Ghana cities going to the presidency. Then now what are you, Mr. Kufuado? Any near Koso war presidency? Then now Modi is carrying a presidency. Ho, Modi is then Modi show suruku and now then now Modi. Legislature, leg Ghana legislators. Yeah, what 275 legislators? Then now some legislators no. What year my Ghana? Say say many more can say he Ghana fui. You bet me, Afa, I install it, Watson. IBM computer, what friend is Watson? No, ah, a artificial intelligence. Ah, ebe ye nine, over 90% of young parliamentarians, no. You bet me, I replace one with Watson. Watson computer, ben we juma. Na, yen downscale. Ah, then ye here 275 parliamentarians out. Then we ye magana. One liability to Ghanaians in a year over 100,000 cities every month per parliamentarian. 100,000 cities. And what is the judiciary? Judiciary, hey. America, yeah, 330 million people. 11 times the size of Ghana. Ghana, yeah, 30.8 million. America, were nine Supreme Court judges. Ghana near what 10 Supreme Court judges, 
a coup wado a twenty eight aka ho nti say say Ghana 30 a, a country of less than 31 million people no ye wo 18 supreme court judges den na how yen 18 den na aden yen na chese krong e wo wi asin na Ghana na wo nti ye hia supreme court judges den ti ye wo supreme court judges a country of less than 31 million 18 supreme court judges ka ka one supreme court judge bia no Liability every hundred and fifty thousand dollars, hundred and fifty thousand cities a month. Kona kubun kunta he ne V8 ordered them, ne bodyguards ne ne driver ne 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 krone ba. Then in T ni yafa an extra eight Supreme Court judges. And un kwan cheng se si ameno moka se ya wo thirty four wo friending ambassadorial post around the world thirty four. Vatican City, ah, a will room cry your war ambassador. Waho, then na ambassador of Vatican City, yeah, Magana. Munkan chile yenge. A den ye war ambassadors were baby to say more tanum ne wa friend den Sri Lanka see Sudan nominee a de den or common a yen ye de buy in tin ye war ambassadors wo Sudan. It doesn't make any kind of sense. So we re e levy. What is this? Yes, some war. Uh, 58 uh, uh, diplomatic missions around the world. Diplomatic mission, no, and Kahun Fasuna said, What will trade desk at the income commerce a bread Ghana? So, diplomatic missions around the world, they are 58. Sika Beng, what the bread Ghana? Moon country near here. A year crong waste of money and resource. Musa Muhuhe E levy. Your bachelor must say E levy, no, Moon Konamuko E infimuamut for two positions now. My creator who named Fasono and Hona Munko infi. I think that more how Ghana for sa MPP for then na Ghana for why you want na the B I N T I S A N T I S A no sa positions he na he was he over two thousand executive positions sa wo executive benefits ne perks wo to kwang wo business class wo nya four by four no money adi sa ni money nesi wo yifi ho and I what also and no no be ma eleven no income from eleven ye be nya fi ho mroso mroso mroso. Then necessary a catch there a good for the new government. Says Sadeno, Munko ye in Fihonum, Namu Boka Gana Foka unnecessarily. Namu be ye in a ye na excavators out Yanko Pandomi and say, Yang Sankoka, Nian Nang, and Yan Fanny Sikani and Fantu ye e levy casson. Mabe catching the Marco Show excavators eighty five. Excavators a barco, ye over hundred and fifty thousand to two hundred thousand. Massa Marco Show and Akaho. Now Pan on no way, ye zi. Cop no way, a tin way, ya no cop no so a wa bonaka ho. Eh, a kufuado and his government. Why? Gana fo. Yam penende em penetina, ye levy no, one eye as a bash and one eye, quite free scan was a ba. Yam pen. In a lay, walk when eh, 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 yan mo babbe ku ye be genome de naming say yer em penet, a kufuado and his government. A ding. A ding. What say? When uh, cluelessness meets unpreparedness, no MPP in Funi now be home. Oh, we're not gonna take this, we're not having this. Mumfa, yam penene in penetina, eleven, ye chia, munko in kwakat legislature, munko kat executive, munko kat judiciary, nasi can ambassadors, any they were friending ambassadorial post. Any uh, 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 diplomatic missions, so many many now won't cancel, no more reduce, no more for computers in your head. Legislators say, Yeah, what 275? You know, you bet me the drone, drone, I replace you one. You're here 275 at the maximum four per region. You're here 64 parliamentarians. You're here 211 parliamentarians. You no, know, where your liability to Ghana at about 100,000 cities every month. Yen chawung in fiho. Come on, enough of this nonsense. Ye rim. Ye rim. We were singing. When you were singing. The masters of the field were coming. We who are young boys are coming. 
The masters of the field are coming. We are boys are coming. To win the race, to win the race, we trust in God, we trust in God. To win the race, we trust in God. And that's for, God. And that's for Opoku. Right? Masters mm -hmm. are coming. Masters are coming. Mm -hmm. Masters are coming to win the race. Oh, 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 oh. Masters are coming. And then they will sing. <laughs> 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 there we go more. Then we will keep quiet. Mm -hmm. Then they will sing. Ah, when they tire, they will come in. Mm -hmm. Diplo, Owens, Diplo, Owens, are we again? We have to win the race and take a cup. We are the masters of the field, the best athletes, famous to all, and decent boys. How Diplo? Then they will start. I've been quiet. They will say, I have a my RTO. I will close. I will do. Prem Quiet Echo. It's my first time. I want your wedding class symbol. Okay. Okay. So when we are the symbol of knowledge, strength, adaptability, uh -huh. energy, freedom, unity, hope, peacemaking, harmony, intelligence, Continue. power of love, strength. Said in class symbols when you know you obia bra bobia e bia boy yeah na ne sign na no pepa no na ye dia ka and in class symbols no. Okay. Now Ghana for what na se ya hu no se. Said ya na na do na kwa ku for do ebu ne man no ye ne je ho. Enti this is the in class symbol for failure. What? <laughs> it's a free nerdico. So I didn't cross him. We almost spent him. You know, yeah. I can't cross him. Also, the president is now a the free nerdico. We almost spent him. You know, yeah. I can't cross him. Also, photo and I didn't cross him. Both for failure. You are failure. You are failure. And I beg you, people, for what we are saying. Yana nanu ma motena ase ye den krasem bo se se mumye mfa we nka ho this photo den krasem bo for free about to we hear of this about to the city I'm telling about this is what you want to use your life for oh my god you know she se she sha kokona ma nanu su dede do no mu twen kama no this bando na enyija befia no no boris bees chicken BBC Nerje. Yes, she a coconama area. Na ke the good old taste of a fia coco. <laughs> yeah, Boris B's chicken. BBC. Fresh, tasty, delicious. Delicious, delicious. Bra Boris B's chicken. BBC. Na bejo full frozen chicken. Gizzard. Chicken feet. Chicken neck. No ni chicken liver. Messi, if you fool in your bejo on there, seri a party. Exclusive. Recluse. The Cato's Hotel, located at Kwaoma, the Bain Soko Bain Road. Book in for your weddings, parties, wedding refreshment, engagements, corporate meetings, all manner of functions at an affordable rate. Comfortable rooms at an affordable rate. Your home for everything you need. Any other food? The Cato's Hotel, a monochiao, a Oklahoma, Mobetimia Koye Mobi Bia, whole book here, or parties, or engagement, corporate, a penny four, and Pesa Mokoya Mo parties, Mokoya Mobi Bia, or cop the Cato's Aquahoma, or down the bank, Soko Bay Road, or qua rooms, you know, at the phone book, or Mobetimia will be Bia, or more more engagement, Monsu Amoye, more christening. More and more, yeah. all manner of parties and functions. Offices for an asset and pay you for a more person who can meet in so and also book here at the phone book or will be out as a work or general home. It be a soft will be an air family beer, more pebble beer, cause I'm a bedroom to them home, will be in a door for more cocoa pebble beer, share my bedroom to them home. The cartus, your home for everything, will do a soon bed joe and also your karma. In the Cato's Hotel, your home for everything you need. Monko Songwe, Namubo Hunse, Mwa Motu Tu Tu Kwan Swa Bam, Mwa Ba, Mwa Boki, Mwa Boki Ya, Mwa Ba Ba Na Mwa Chi Ya, Yesi Mwa Chi, Kama 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 Kama. In the Cato's Hotel, your home for everything. I am a boy. 
itisikaso omenyo hiamai hey nenam amemua enkoyi enti no maza <laughs> akomde